So can we say that there is a, a relation between the fatalism and the lack of education? For example, you mentioned about uh, Islamic and Middle East countries that uh, women uh, face with the discrimination in their society. So maybe can we explain the situation uh, about uh, when, when women uh, are not able to uh, reach the uh, qualified education, maybe they explain, they try to explain everything with fatalist approach. They try to explain everything, the, the, the sound broke up. Fatal approach. A, a, fatal, a fatal epoch, uh, right. Um, yes, well, I, I mean, I think it's, um, uh, it's, very, you know, it's very common that people, in a sense, collaborate mm -hmm. in their own problems they, by taking up a fatalistic attitude. Um, being, as it were, uh, um, content in whatever position society has put you in, um, that's the opposite of activism. It's the opposite of trying to do something about it. Um, worrying about whether it's uh, just or fair, or whether it's uh, an imposition. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question will be about quasi-realism. Oh, yes. And <laughs> what is quasi-realism and why are you calling it quasi? Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, well, it's a term that I introduced about 40 years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, it was like this. There were two schools of thought about the nature of morality. Mm -hmm. um, one school is called realism. Um, and it's, realism, unfortunately, has many meanings in philosophy. But what I got in mind uh, uh, was people who said, there is truth. There's right and wrong. Um, you can be correct about it or you can be incorrect. Um, it's an, a very important thing to try and get right. And it's a topic of knowledge. You can know um, what's right and you can know what's wrong. Um, the, um, I mean, that sounds in a sense almost common sense and that's part of the problem. The other um, uh, philosophy of ethics, meta-ethics as it's called, um, uh, was more um, a descendant of the Scottish schools. They're sometimes called the Scottish sentimentalists, which is a, another unfortunate word. Um, but they emphasized the role of passion and desire. They said that really ethics is a kind of projection of our passions and desires, our concerns for things. So, um, uh, when you say that something's wrong, you're not really describing it, attributing a sort of property to it. Like if you said that something was square or colored red or whatever it might be, um, you're rather expressing an attitude towards it. You're expressing a, um, if you say it's wrong, you're presumably expressing a desire that it doesn't happen or a wish to alter it. If you say that something's right, then you're, expressing content with it, you're, you're happy with it. Um, now that's the Scottish school. This is David Hume and Adam Smith, especially. Um, the, uh, it came down into the 20th century and there were sort of battle lines drawn between the sentimentalist approach and the cognitive or truth-based approach, uh, the realist approach. Um, because the realists said, look, you sentimentalists, you have, there's, there's no topic here. There's nothing, nothing to know about. There's no truth or fact in this area, according to you. And that's really bad. And the sentimentalists said, yes, but you can't tell me anything about these truths and facts. They're metaphysically very strange. I mean, roughly, when you think when, um, uh, if God created the world, he just had to create a world of what is the case. He didn't have to create a world of what ought to be the case as well. So a moral reality is a, 
very difficult thing to feel you've got hold of. Um, so those are the battlegrounds. Um, that was the issue. Um, now people thought that they knew how to debate that issue. Um, and my contribution was I came along and I said, no, I don't think the, I don't think the arguments in place in this area are very good. Um, I don't think you ought to be swayed by some of the arguments that were quite common. Um, because, and I was writing mainly on behalf of the sentimental school, um, and I want to say the sentimental school doesn't have to reject all the things the realists are saying. The sentimentalists can accept, for example, that um, it's not only wrong to stamp on babies for fun, it's true that it's wrong to stamp on babies for fun. <laughs> or if you like, it's a fact that it's wrong to stamp on babies for fun. Um, once you've said the one thing, you can go on and say the others. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be seen as adding to the temperature, as, as making it harder. Now, of course, you could debate whether it's wrong to stamp on babies for fun, although I think anybody who thought it was okay would be very odd, <laughs> might be in prison. Um, so, um, but you, in principle, you could talk about it, but you're not going to add to the discussion of it if you go to this meta level and say that facts and truth and things are somehow elusive or invisible in the case of ethics, in the way that they're uh, common sense in every day in the case of our everyday descriptions of the world around us. So I, I began to say, look, the, the issue here is more complicated than you might think, uh, because it brings into question notions like truth and fact and reason and so on. Um, so my, um, my quasi-realist was a sort of, a, it was a figure I invented who said, look, I'm going to imitate virtually all the things that realists say, but I'm not going to regard them as metaphysically suspect. It's as if there's a reality, um, but I'm not going to accept any, any obligation to say anything about it, to worry about its nature, mm. um, or, or to um, take part in the old debates. So, so it was really an attempt to change the landscape in which those things were discussed. Oh, uh, Professor, then uh, what is the difference between a quasi-realist and a moral realist? Like, where can we draw the line? Mm. Well, um, <laughs> that's proved a very difficult question. <laughs> um, the, um, there was a, a very good paper written by a friend of mine uh, called Jamie Dreyer, um, called um, uh, The Threat of Creeping Minimalism, Morality and the Threat of Creeping Minimalism. Mm -hmm. And um, he's pointed out that by the time the quasi-realist is, if the quasi-realist is successful um, and ends up sounding very like a realist, then the debate seems to have not only changed, but it seems to have vanished. And, um, and in that case, you would, neither side has won. It turns out they were talking about nothing. Um, and that's the threat of creeping minimalism, as he called it. Um, and th that's been a very, very influential paper. And a lot of philosophers think, yeah, there's no good methodology in this area. So now it's not just that we don't know what um, sentimentalists have to say, we don't know what realists have to say either. Um, it's as if the, all, the, all the terminology within which this debate was conducted has proved to be very, very much less significant than people thought. Thanks Thank for you. your answer. <laughs> I would like to ask you about scientific realism. What are your thoughts about it? Uh, the scientists, scientists asserted that 
uh, science is independent and it works for humanity. However, we know that postmodernist perspective approaches science as something ideological. They claim that science is shaped by individuals' backgrounds, such as their education, mm -hmm. uh, society where they grow up. At that point, how do you approach scientific realism? Do you think it is rational to trust science? and its purposes for humanity? Yes. Um, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I regard myself as a scientific realist, not as a quasi-realist in science. Um, it's, um, I think what was correct about postmodernism, um, the view that um, um, society surrounding culture, surrounding traditions, uh, human personalities, have much more to do with the development of science than just, as it were, the abstract pursuit of truth. Um, I think there was some uh, truth in that. The truth was that um, which um, direction scientific inquiry takes at a particular time will be determined by the uh, context, the matrix within which it's happening, including the social context. So, for example, I mean, this is common sense. If you just look at the amount of scientific research devoted um, in 2020 to virology and epidemiology, it's, you know, a thousand times greater than it would have been in 2019. And that's because of the COVID virus. So all laboratories throughout the medical world um, and chemist, uh, chemical, biochemical worlds are uh, throwing resources at trying to discover a cure for that virus. And they wouldn't have been doing that if the virus hadn't, you know, become such an important feature of people's lives. So of course, science responds to the problems of the day. Um, scientists developed the atom bomb during the Second World War. Well, they wouldn't have done it if there hadn't been a war going on. This is because they wanted a weapon that would finish that war, that the Americans developed the atom bomb so quickly. Um, and um, you can point to endless examples of that, in which a need in society or perceived, something perceived as a need drives the direction of scientific inquiry. But I don't see that as an anti-realist point in, about science, as the postmodernists did, because it's just pointing out the obvious fact that science is a human activity. It's an expensive activity, so it needs resources, and people have to decide where to put their resources. Um, so, of course, there is a human background to science. But that doesn't, as, as it were, filter through to say that the sociology or the politics infects the science um, and somehow it stops it from being objective. Um, let me give you an example. In the 17th century, um, when the well, 17th to 18th century, um, one of the major problems for navigators at sea was knowing their longitude. They, they, they were good at finding out how far up the earth they were or down, that is their latitude, how far they were from the equator, how far they were from the North Pole. Um, but they were very bad at determining how far east or west they come. Um, and they, everyone knew that this, this problem could be solved if you had a good enough clock. Um, and that generated an enormous amount of effort into developing a clock which would keep accurate time at sea. If you think of an ordinary pendulum clock, it's no good at sea because it's tipping around all over the place. So um, finding a so-called marine chronometer, an accurate watch or clock, would work at sea um, was a huge need and it was a need because people kept crashing into coastlines and getting lost and so on so so the uh, and the reason they needed it was because the uh, international trade was developing it was important to conduct these long sea journeys 
and so you've got this um, this problem. And there was a this huge prize in uh, in England for the first person who could develop a timepiece that that kept time at sea. Um, that's a piece of science which was entirely driven by these commercial activities and commercial necessities. Um, but of course, once it was completed, people knew the time at sea, and that's objective. They knew when to say, oh, it is now noon at Greenwich or noon in London, um, and get it right. And the fact that they got it right is a perfectly objective fact. They, there was no, um, no kind of French skepticism possible <laughs> about, about the truth about the time. Um, even though the motivation for finding it was commercial. So, you know, you've got to separate out the, um, the value of the results from the possibly somewhat suspect motivation that led people to, to try to find the result. <laughs>